doing things you never thought possible. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid Food Processor Collection. And welcome to the British Library Food Season 2020, generously supported by KitchenAid. I'm Angela Clutton, Guest Director for the season. I've had just the most enormous pleasure working with Polly uh, Russell, who is the season's founder and curator in the three years that the season's been running. Um, when Polly and I were planning the season, one of the things we really wanted to make sure we did was highlight the work of truly significant food figures. And tonight we definitely have that with Ken Hom. Ken is going to be speaking with Fuchsia Dunlop, Fuchsia will introduce Ken, but just to say a few words about Fuchsia, she is in her own right, in her own right, a complete specialist on Chinese cuisine, has written six books, and this year won the Fortnum Mason Cookbook of the Year Award. Please, please, please do ask your questions of Ken and Fuchsia. You can scroll down and see where to put those questions in. A couple of other admin things before we get going. You'll also be able to see where you can give feedback on the event, you can donate to the work of the library and find the social media tags to join in the conversation online. But for now, I think all I have to do is hand over to Fuchsia. Thank you, Angela. And, and hello, Ken. Lovely hello. <laughs> speaking to us from Paris. Um, yeah, I don't think anyone really has had as great an impact on British perceptions of Chinese food as Ken Hom. He burst onto our television screens in 1984 with um, Ken Hom's Chinese Cookery, which was the first British TV series devoted to Chinese food. And incredibly, the book that accompanied this TV series, I think, has now sold one and a half million copies. Um, in 1986, Ken came out with the Ken Hong, Hong Walk, which was expected to sell modestly, but had sold more than 100,000 before Christmas the same year. And Ken is probably the reason why a survey published in 2001 found that 65% of British households owned a Chinese walk. Um, I'm not going to go through all Ken's accolades and accomplishments because that would take up the whole talk, <laughs> but just to say that I think you've now brought out 36 books in English with foreign editions, it's something like 80. You, you have an OBE for services to the culinary arts, um, and now you split your time between France and Thailand, and I mean really no one is better known as the face of Chinese food than you are. So I just wanted to start by asking you, you were born in Tucson, Arizona, you grew up in Chinatown in Chicago, and you started your career in California. So how was it that you became the face of British Chinese food? Well, you know, it, it's one of these stories that actually, um, this is funny, uh, Fuchsia, because uh, the, uh, a Chinese film production company actually wants to do a film about it. <laughs> exactly. How does one, you know, born in Arizona, grew up in Chinatown, I did not speak English until I was six years old, um, uh, speaking Cantonese, and how did I wind up being on... BBC and British television. And it, it, to make a long story short, um, when I uh, did my first book, um, uh, about uh, two years after, I met a woman named Matter Jeffrey. And she had just done a, a series with BBC that was big hit on Indian cookery. And she said, BBC has been searching for someone to do um, a series on Chinese cookery. And they've been searching for two years and they haven't found the right person. And I think why I sort of fitted the profile was because what I was doing was not just being a cook or a chef, but also I was teaching cooking. I was teaching at the California Culinary Academy um, about Chinese food, uh, explaining as you do I'm one of your biggest fans, Fuchsia, by the way, she's, her books are the Bible for me. <laughs> I, I have to give you back the accolades because I'm, I'm your biggest fan. And the thing is to explain to people about something which is so different from their experience. Um, I think, for example, um, when I first wrote the book for the series, I was told, Ken, the amount of meat 
is so small that you're putting in a recipe for four. And it's because, as you know, Fuchsia, we use sort of, if you will, meat to garnish our vegetables. I mean, what makes actually real Chinese cookery so healthy is the amount of protein that we use to veggies it is, outs I mean, outsized, right? I mean, it's small compared to the amount of vegetables. And it's because that comes from a long history of, because we did not have a lot of uh, access to meat. But um, also our food is very flavorful. And, and as you know, you're an expert on this. And also how the history of Chinese food because of its land mass and its history, how it's so diverse. It's almost as, um, I mean, if you think about France, France has maybe about eight regional cooking, but if you think about China, which is much grander and bigger with a longer history and each region, I mean, I remember when I first read your book on Sichuan cooking, I mean, it was, it was so, fantastic because even though I knew something about it, I learned so much about it because it's an entity in itself. And that sort of um, history, I think about Chinese cookery is what is so fascinating about, just like China, right? As you know, I mean. When, but casting back to the beginning of your career. So, I mean, it, that was like three or four decades ago. Yeah. And that's a time when, you know, for most British people, Chinese food, the only Chinese food they would have encountered would have been the local takeaway um, serving. Well, they would also <laughs> serve fish and chips. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. but where, where you'd have a very simplified and sort of adapted yeah. form of right. Chinese food. And I was very amused actually reading your autobiography, Ken Hom, My Stir Fried Life, that um, there's a photograph in that of you with your TV crew in Britain, in yeah. London in the 1980s. And they're all sort of white British people and they're all holding chopsticks as if they're doing something really extraordinary that they've never done before. And I just wondered, you know, when you first came to Britain, what were your impressions of, of Chinese food here and British perceptions of it? And also, could you get the ingredients you needed for Chinese cooking here? Well, it was very difficult. I remember when I first came to Britain it was in 1971. You weren't even born yet, I think, hardly. <laughs> and uh, uh, I remember um, I was staying with friends that I had met in California in, at university. And as a thank you for them putting me up, sleeping on their, their sofa, I wanted to do a Chinese meal for them. And just finding the ingredients was very, very difficult. I mean, um, I went to Chinatown, uh, things were not in abundance. And you must remember, uh, Fuchsia, in 71, China was not really open yet. And so a lot of some ingredients either came from Hong Kong and even then was a very small thing. And, and to tell you the truth, even um, I had come from California, I was shocked at the, um, uh, sort of supermarkets in the UK because um, the amounts of variety were very, very small. And I remember uh, seeing carrots at like Tesco, they were shriveled. <laughs> uh, you know, everything in California was, it was the beginning of the organic movement and we, we had such abundance of food. And uh, so it was a rather shock. And then I saw Chinese food, like in Chinese restaurant, a chips and curry. I said, what's that from? <laughs> but I realized that the Chinese are very smart because, you know, in order to survive, you have to give, you have to be open to everything, right? I mean, Fuchsia, I bet when you first uh, uh, saw I mean, curry and chips, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> as you know, that's not Chinese. They hardly even have potatoes in China. <laughs> I found out recently reading a book by Barclay Price about Chinese food in Britain, I think, was that a lot of um, Chinese takeaways actually started out as fish and chip shops. And they yes, were I know. Chinese families. They were very <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, Even fish and chips, I, I mean, that's something I discovered when I came to Britain. So I actually I fell in love with it. I, I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> Yeah. 
but uh, uh, just that um you know so you you were trying to bring Chinese food to people who really didn't know very much about it and um you know you've very much made Chinese food approachable for British people right. taking it into their homes with your tv series with your recipes with even with a series of ready meals and of course right. your blocks but um, I, I, I wanted to be authentic without compromising uh, without anglicizing it but at the same time I, I I look for things to make it accessible too because I, I think if you make it so foreign so complicated that people say oh my god this is not for me then they they will never cook it and I think people really understand Chinese food when they cook it themselves yeah. and they say wow I can do that. And it's just as good. It's even better than my takeaway, right? Uh, I, I think um, in your books, you, you, you teach that too, that people can actually make Chinese food in their home. Yeah. But I think, you know, you've just sort of highlighted something that there is always, I think, when you're writing about or presenting a, a, a cuisine that's foreign to your readers, to your audience, yes. there's always a sort of tension between trying to introduce the real and authentic cuisine and not frightening people, making it approachable and familiar. And you tell a very funny story in your autobiography about how you were teaching a, a cooking course in California and you were asked to do a serious cooking, Chinese cooking course. And you started by slaughtering a live chicken in front of a bunch of Americans. And then afterwards, the person who hired you to run the class said, well, Ken, we didn't mean that serious. <laughs> I just, I, I wondered how you sort of, well, your career you'd struck this balance between trying to promote real Chinese food but at the same time you know steady on there yeah can you imagine me bringing a chicken on in BBC studio <laughs> live <laughs> well you know it, when I first taught um, uh, cooking to chefs I thought well they need to know where a chicken comes from I mean this is how I learned how to cook and I don't think you really can know about food when you don't, when you don't know it from A to Z. Do you agree with me? Yeah. Fuchsia. I mean, you know, things don't come wrapped in cellophane and, you know, wrapped uh, already cut up for you like that. I think you have to know. And also too, I think when you know where it comes from, you respect the food even more, right? And, and you don't waste anything. That's another thing. And, and that's something I wanted to show because you take the chicken from its initial concept. And I mean, I think the only thing that I couldn't do anything with was with the feathers because I don't know how to make pillows. I mean, <laughs> but, um, also, too, I think it's very, very important, especially in these days, to talk about waste and not wasting anything. And, and that's what I love about the Chinese concept, too. Um, I, I grew up not wasting anything. And I, I think we're coming back to that now. Yeah. And just, you know, talking about, about um, who, who were your sort of greatest culinary influences? Because you really, you started cooking very young, yes. didn't you? When you were really a small boy with your, your uncle's restaurant. And it's my uncle, because my father passed away when I, I never knew my father, because uh, um, he passed away when I was eight months old. And, but my uncle became my sort of my surrogate father. And he had a very successful restaurant. He was really in, he was a foodie. And even though he didn't, he knew how to cook, he didn't actually cook himself, but he knew how to run. He was a good businessman too. <laughs> and he really knew how to run a restaurant and he, and he knew about food. And we're talking about the fifties and sixties um, when, when China was not even open and he would travel to places like Hong Kong and Taiwan and recruit chefs and bring them back to to uh, Chicago Chinatown to make really genuine Chinese food. I mean, we had Hunan dishes, which nobody ever heard of in those days. And um, uh, my uncle was really, very really good. He, he was a real foodie and he taught me a lot and about business as well. He was a good businessman, but he also was a real foodie and he loved food. He loved to eat, even though he's skinny. <laughs> 
<laughs> he loved to eat and he knew about food. Right. But you, and you grew up in, you know, you said that you didn't speak um, English until you started school and you grew up in this very sort of closed Chinatown community, which kept themselves, you know, people kept themselves for themselves. And um, one of the a sort of perennial theme in the accounts of people growing up Chinese in America and in Britain is of the, the struggle to fit in and sort of self-consciousness about their Chinese identity. And particularly this theme that comes up again and again is of having to put up with their classmates at school, teasing them because of the smelly foreign odd food in their lunch boxes. And I just wondered, was that your experience too? Yes, um, it, it was interesting because Chicago was, uh, I mean, really cold and horrible weather. And uh, um, I always had the last laugh because um, uh, we, I grew up very poor, but my mother used to make me rice with a little bit of Chinese sausage and veggies in a thermos. And so um, during the dead of winter, where all these American children were eating cold bologna sandwich, I would quietly open up my thermos and you could smell <laughs> the aromas. That's something that she stir fried in a wok and put it in. And I was happily eating out of my, <laughs> and I started, uh, actually I started a business of trading things. And I wanted to see what their thing tasted like. And I thought, no, that's horrible. So I got my revenge <laughs> that way in the future. But you're right, you know, it's difficult um, uh, for people like me to fit in because um, just look at my face. I mean, um, and I sympathize with my uh, fellow students who are black as well, because they we suffer the same sort of taunting and um, unacceptance, if you will, of who we were. And um, of course, you learn English very, very quickly because um, you have to stand on your feet. And it was. Uh, a struggle. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, it's ironic. I feel more British than I feel American because maybe because uh, I grew up there. I, I, I didn't feel American. And people, um, even when I started doing my first book, I mean, people said, you can't be American. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that's something I, um, it was interesting. I've never, uh, I mean, even before I was known in Britain, um, I'd never experienced that in Britain. Right. But you, you said it, it seems to have been a kind of watershed moment for you when you went to Hong Kong for the first time in 1980. And, and you say in your book that um, it was like coming home. And, and, and not only that, I spoke the language. Everybody yeah. looked like me. And it was really interesting future because um, I would speak a Cantonese that was rather archaic because we were cut off for such a long time. And people would ask me, when did you leave Hong Kong? <laughs> no, I said, I, you know, I wasn't born in Hong Kong because my Cantonese was very rustic. Imagine, uh, I, I guess it's, it's like British that went over uh, 30, 50 years ago. And then when they come back to Britain, there are, are things you don't say anymore. Uh, words uh, become different and uh, uh, language changes. And so it was interesting. I, I love being in Hong Kong. And what, what was the food like? I mean, was it like the food you'd grown up with in America or was it completely no. new to you? It was uh, actually, I, I first came to Hong Kong in 1980 and Hong Kong was really on the cusp of you know, really exploding um, economic wise. Um, French chefs were coming to Hong Kong to see things. Um, Chinese chefs were uh, open, exploring things. And I was sort of bowled over by the quality of cooking because you know, really in Hong Kong, there's nothing to do except shop and eat. So. So eating better be good. <laughs> There's only so much things you can buy, but you can eat all the time. And I, I was just amazed at the quality of cooking and how the Chinese chefs in Hong Kong were 
open to discovering Italian, um, because they were cooking in hotels that would have French chefs as guests, Italian chefs as guests. And um, also Hong Kong uh, chefs were becoming quite cosmopolitan, which Chinese chefs are becoming now too, because they, they're open and they travel. I mean, people like Da Dong in Beijing, um, they're aware of something outside of their own country. Um, I just want to take at this point a reminder to everyone listening to this that we'll be taking questions at the end. So please, if you would like to send in a question, scroll to the bottom of the page and send it and then we'll, we'll come to the questions later. Um, and, and back to you, Ken. So um, I think it was it was in 1988 that you went to mainland China for the first no, time. 1983. 1983. It was interesting because um, um, a group had hired me in Hong Kong um, from America and I uh, to, to do a cookery class. And then I went with them to China. It was really quite amazing because the restaurant I went to, Fuchsia, was like something out of the Middle Ages in Europe. Uh, this local restaurant I went to had bones on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're, 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 you're too young to see all that, but they had bones on the floor where people would eat and they'd throw the bones on the floor. So when you walk, it'd be crunching. <laughs> I've done a bit of bone throwing myself, Ken, in my time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, I, I was shocked at the um, uh, sort of lack of quality of cooking in China. And, and actually when I first went to China, uh, in 83. Uh, then I went back in a uh, much longer time in 88 and 89. And um, I thought, I mean, this is amazing. I went to a place in Beijing that was famous for Peking duck. And I said, I wasn't even born in China and I make a better Peking duck than they do. How is that possible? And I think because people didn't care about their cooking. It, it made me sad. They were, uh, it was run like a state restaurant. So they didn't really care if the clients were happy or not. Uh, the quality of cooking was, was not there. And also the service was, I mean, abysmal. I mean, I mean, I think that's fairly typical of most state-run economies and people who visited China in that period and also Absolutely. the Soviet Union will testify to that. Yeah, it's funny because actually, although I was in Sichuan later than that, so in the the first time in the sort of mid nine early mid nineties, but although the service wasn't great and certainly restaurants weren't as smart as they are now, the food was was fantastic. But, yeah. but I think I suppose when you were first there, China was coming out of this long period really of poverty yeah. and isolation, and um, and sort of finding its. Feet I, I was able to find good restaurants, but you had to really look for them. Uh, for people who cared and mostly they were family owned restaurants, as you would say, rather than sort of the state affairs and um, it shows that that doesn't work. <laughs> so when you went back in 1988 and you were researching this book, um, The Taste of China, and this time you were really trying to look at Chinese food in its regional and cultural context. Yes. And I just wondered, you know, traveling around the country, what that was like for someone who'd been brought up on mainly Cantonese food. Uh, it, it was a revelation because I, 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 I learned so much and actually I was um, quite humbled, in, even though I had written about, did a lot of research about Chinese food to actually, I mean, see certain things like in Yunnan where they made um, almost 30 courses out of one goat. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's, that's amazing. Uh, you know, I defied, you know, all these great chefs to do something like that. And it was very, very good. And um, it was nice to know that some things still existed. And so when, when China started opening up and exploding, you could see, I mean, now the food in China, as, as you know, Fuchsia, is pretty... Of, I mean, really fantastic. Yeah. 
But I think it's also just sort of remarkable how Chinese food um, in America and in Britain has changed because yes. when you were growing up and also when I was growing up, I mean, the only food that was widely available was based on, on Cantonese cooking. Yes, mainly because the vast majority of, of emigrants oh, from much. China had been yes. from Hong Kong and the Cantonese South. But of course, China is a vast country with this exactly. extraordinarily diverse regional cuisines. And, um, you know, in the last sort of 10 years or so, we've seen this, this incredible blossoming of restaurants of Sichuanese, Hunanese, Dongbei, and, and it's totally changed the Chinese food landscape. But I, I just wonder, Ken, do you think that, um, that people in Britain, people abroad generally are finally getting a sense of, of the vastness and diversity of Chinese cuisine? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think if you see Chinese food, I mean, we're fast forwarding to now, I, it's another world. Um, I mean, thanks to people like you, um, not only your books and, and also the exposure and opening to China has, has woken up uh, everybody's consciousness about what real Chinese food is about and how vast it is just like China is. Yeah, but one of the, I think one of the weird things about Western perceptions of Chinese food um, has been the idea that while it's really delicious, it should be cheap. Yeah, and it's exactly. a crazy reduction of one of the world's greatest cuisines, um, greatest culinary cultures to a sort of cheap, predictable takeaway menu. Yeah. And you, know, you yourself, you've personally done a great deal to raise the status of Chinese food. You've cooked for presidents, prime ministers and film stars, and you've worked with many outstanding chefs from all kinds of different culinary traditions. But I think it's still quite a sticky stereotype. But one great change since you started your career and, and even more recently, is that um, you know China is no longer isolated from the outside world and in recent years there's been this rapid development growing wealth um, you know more Chinese people from different regions living abroad and also sort of growing muscle on the international national stage and I wondered how much you think it's you know the rise of China and the opening up of China has has, has affected western sort of perceptions of Chinese food and, and its status and its value well, it's like everything. Um, um, when you know China um, uh, sort of woke up, I think people also woke up to not only uh, the Chinese economy, the Chinese people, but to its cuisine, and that it's not stereotypical, as you say. Just actually. It was Cantonese food, but even bad Cantonese food. I mean, I was able to see that when I first went to Hong Kong. I said, look, I mean, some of the food that was in America was just, I mean, nothing like what was, uh, what was in Hong Kong. And, and subsequently, when I traveled throughout China, it opened a new world to me. And I think because of all this traveling between the West and China, there are many um, Westerners who travel on business. They go to Wuhan, they go to Hunan, they discover, because as you know, the Chinese hospitality business, doing business is, is always constantly feeding people and showing them their cuisine. And so that I think has been a good ambassadorship for Chinese food and a lot of people um, uh, have come back to me and says, Chinese food is not like the Chinese food we know, <laughs> which is good. Yeah. And another really strange kind of contradiction, I think, in Western attitudes to Chinese food has been that, you know, few cuisines globally have been as much loved and as ubiquitous as Chinese. Um, but at the same time, there's always been this undercurrent of racism and suspicion about it. You know, in the early days, there were all these stereotypes in American Chinatowns, oh, sure. Chinese people eating rats and things yeah. like that. And, um, you know, in many ways, it seems that we've left all this behind. But then I've been shocked with the coronavirus pandemic this year. There was this sudden eruption of really ugly stereotypes about Chinese wet markets, which, as, as anyone who knows China knows, is basically just a fresh produce market and usually not selling many exotic things at all but um and um yeah just this this sort of um, negativity about chinese food and i wondered after all these years i mean does this make you just feel really weary at times 
Well, I, I think it's uh, a battle that we've always fought. I mean, I, I, I think people also need to understand that, um, uh, you know, China's an ancient culture. There's a lot of things they believed in, uh, that things are good for you because you eat that, even though it's not true. It's uh, uh, there's full of misinformation, um, just like in the West. And that um, uh, this is something that the Chinese will have to deal with. Um, uh, they're gonna have higher, uh, have to have uh, higher uh, sanitary standards. You know, it wasn't so long ago um, that all kinds of things were spread in the West. I mean, a um, hundred years ago, uh, you know, sanitary conditions, people were constantly uh, getting sick because their food wasn't clean, it wasn't hygienic, and that sort of thing. And that, that's, uh, I mean, you have to think that uh, China in 40 something years, they have come very, very far. And yet, there's a lot of things they still need to deal with, which they will deal with. And it, it, it's just like in the West, if you, you know, read in, a, in America, uh, this guy named Sinclair wrote about the horrific things of slaughterhouses in Chicago. I mean, it was a book that catapulted uh, sanitary conditions. And this is uh, how things change. And um, um, uh, we need to fight these uh, stereotypes as well. I think um, as people say that I mean, we're all on one planet together and we need to help each other. We need to um, share things together and we need to learn from each other. And let's make this a better world. <laughs> but I suppose what I'm getting at is that I think, um, you know, there are legitimate concerns about practices in some Chinese markets. Course, which, you know, I, I think the Chinese will be taking that on board. You know, uh, with the pandemic. Absolutely. Yeah, and I and I and also, you know, there is a problem with a minority of people with lots of money wanting to eat exotic things. But it is a minority thing, and I, I do feel that you know sometimes, you know, we're all guilty of econ of, of um, crimes against the environment and also yeah. cruelty in Western slaughterhouses, as you've just said. And I just mm -hmm. I feel that the the, the racial stereotyping actually um, goes against working together to solve these problems because exactly it comes from exactly. A I yeah. mean, it, it doesn't help to blame um, a certain people for something that happens. I think when something happens, they said, okay, let's work together. Let's find out what the problem is and let's work on it. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right. And it's, um, uh, it's a silly thing that we humans are <laughs> guilty of. <laughs> I think we're all guilty of things like that. And Chinese food is delicious, <laughs> as we know. The one thing, you know, you've been looking, I mean, particularly Hong Kong is a place that's very close to you, that um, the food scene has changed dramatically in the last sort of 40 years or something. Um, would you like to say a bit about that, about how it's changed, do you think, and people's relationship with food? Well, you know, um, people, brag about food and about where they eat in Hong Kong. They love to share, you know, uh, I ate at, you know, Bow Innovation, <laughs> that sort of thing, and Michelin star restaurants. Um, it's sort of bragging rights. But at the same time, um, I think people in uh, Hong Kong have become much more sophisticated. For instance, it's interesting, Fuchsia, the wet markets in Hong Kong um, has really changed. I remember when I first did cookery classes there in 1980, uh, um, the wet markets were like in China. And um, since SARS in the early 2000s, all of that has, uh, they've cleaned that all up in, in China, I mean, in Hong Kong. And I think that uh, people are learning lessons. And I mean, we, we have to evolve as th when things happen, okay, this is not to be done, we'll have to change this. I think people in uh, Hong Kong are very aware of this type of problem. And this is why they crack down on it really quite quickly. 
I mean, wearing face masks, uh, social distancing. And also it helps that in Asia, there's none of this kissing and hugging and even shaking of hands. <laughs> there's, a, I mean, there's not that kind of contact, you know, that's, that's reserved for <laughs> intimate <laughs> things, not for uh, people that you know. And um, perhaps that's helped too. It's interesting how all of Asia has handled this uh, crisis and uh, maybe we can learn some things from it. Apart from Hong Kong and, um, you know, you, you were just saying earlier that you had some quite negative impressions of Chinese food when you were first there in the 80s, but you, you went back to do this another big BBC series with Ching Hee Huang exploring yes. China in, I think, 2012. Yes. And I, I wondered what your impressions were of China traveling around different regions then, you know. Well, you know, it's interesting, uh, Fuchsia, I was bowled over. Um, and what I meant by bowled over about how the quality of Chinese food had, um, just like China, how, how China has changed, so has its food. Um, upward, in other words, quality. Uh, you had people cooking Chinese food of really, for the first time I saw, you know, Michelin quality Chinese food. Um, in Sichuan, as well as in Beijing, how people really cared about what they were doing. But these were all, again, private businesses. So, you know, for that, making money is good. Capitalism is good for food. <laughs> I think it's helped really Chinese food to um, come up to world class levels in China. And I, I was astonished at also the variety of foods that were uh, available in markets that I didn't see in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, the effect of even like 30 years was just, I mean, simply amazing. And we had a, fun, a lot of fun. We drank a lot of baju. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was interesting how, also to see the Chinese drinking wine Western wines. And I, th I thought, oh, see, that's good. They're learning things from us as we are learning things from them. And uh, the, when you see China just opening up like that to the world, it's, it's improved their food, even though, uh, because they're learning about quality, that quality really counts and makes money. It's a powerful incentive. <laughs> One thing that you, you said earlier about, you know, so the, the proportion of vegetables eaten in Chinese cuisine, because that's another really, I think the most bizarre of all the, the Western stereotypes about, of Chinese food is that it's unhealthy. And there's a, this idea that's, that's grown up that Chinese food is a bit junky, that it's full of MSG, that it's all deep fried. And as you know, nothing could be further from you know the, the the traditional chinese diet which with so many vegetables and i wondered um you know this is something i really hope will shift and i hope that people will recognize that china is really a source of inf inspiration and information about how to eat healthily and well but well, do you, you know, think that's it's interesting uh Fusha, that you said that because uh for instance um uh breast cancer for women was almost unheard of in China before. Why? Because they were not eating a lot of red meat. And it, it has started to come into China and has risen. And obesity, which, I mean, he, he never saw anybody obese or having all these health problems that we have in the West. And it's because this rising um, wealth in China, as you know, like. Chinese are eating so much more red meat now, which is not their traditional way of eating. And it's, it's really unhealthy. And I think there's a movement now to go back, as you said, to, to its original source of eating less meat, especially red meat, and eating more vegetables, going back to traditional style, which is, I mean, this is how I grew up. I mean, I, I couldn't believe the size of the steak in America, I said, this is for a village, a <laughs> Chinese village. <laughs> I mean, it was huge. And um, 
and I thank God I grew up that way because I, I was never a big meat eater. And, and I find that all my friends in my age group are doing the same thing. They're eating less and less meat simply because it's healthier. And it, it's the traditional Chinese method. Is, it, is that something that you've consciously tried to promote through your work? Ben? Oh, absolutely. Trying to, without sort of proselytizing, as you know, <laughs> it's sort of preaching. Um, I think you try to show that, for instance, as you know, uh, Fuchsia, a steamed fish could be so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it's so healthy and it's so lovely. You know, people, you don't need to fry it. <laughs> Frying is good. I mean, I love my fish and chip, but steaming is also fantastic. <laughs> well, one of one of the funny things about about Chinese culture, I think, is that while people take food extremely seriously to the point of obsession, that actual cooking is traditionally a very low status profession. Right. And it's something that you know few Chinese parents want their children to be chefs. Your your own mother brought you up in really quite tough conditions on her own after after the early death of your father, and you were her only child and you say in your book that um you, you know your mother really couldn't understand why you wanted to cook and she used to ask you um why you didn't become a dentist instead <laughs> and i just wondered that you know at what point in your glittering international career did she maybe accept that you'd made the right choice no you know what happened um um i think it was in 2000 um my mother used to say you know can you really have to get a real job? In other words, you know, stop this cooking stuff on television and things like that. So she said, um, and that changed in 2000 because um, I had cooked for the Chinese uh, president's first visit to the UK, to, to uh, England. And uh, there was a, a photo call uh, I cooked at number 10 um, after the, of course, the, the, the first meal is also always given by protocol by the queen. And uh, I cooked at number 10. And the next day there was a photo call and it hit the front pages of all the Chinese papers. So when I went to see my mom the next week, uh, a month later, she said, maybe you should continue cooking. Not a bad thing. <laughs> because she, she had faith for the first time, uh, you know, that I had this status and, you know, it's Chinese mother, it's like a Jewish mother. <laughs> you know, you're doing good son, okay, continue now. <laughs> but I had to take that. I mean, this is after I've been cooking for God knows how long, teaching for 20 years. <laughs> it took that <laughs> to convince my mom. <laughs> But it's interesting that you were saying that cooking is considered a low status because uh, when my book was um, translated into Chinese, I mean, they, they, they couldn't understand why someone like me had this kind of status in the West because it was not, as you said, regarded highly. Well, it's quite funny, actually, Ken, because um, since my own book was published in Chinese last year and I did a book tour and the question that came up again and again was that um, Chinese people just could not understand that my parents were able to accept that they sent me to Cambridge and then I wanted to be, be a cook. <laughs> my parents were very happy about it, but they, they found this baffling. I think there's Chinese genes in you. <laughs> Anyway, I'd like to go to some questions yeah. um, fr from our audience now. And there's one from Hannah, a question for both of us, but um, what Chinese food do you most crave and feel nostalgic for? Uh, that's interesting. I, I, I'm crazy about Sichuan cooking because um, that's a very uncantonese side of me. I do love spices a lot. In fact, I like it so much that I travel with a spice kit of, of chilies and Sichuan peppercorns and oil and things like that. Um, but um, I, my two favorites are Sichuan and Cantonese. I mean, they, um, I love Cantonese for its purity, for uh, I feel cleanse when I eat like a steam fish. It's so, it seems so plain and yet it's so 
nurturing and wonderful to me. And how about you? I think. Ooh, well, I mean, it would have to be Sichuanese as well, because that would take yes. me back to falling in love with Chinese food in that life changing first year in, in, in Sichuan. So I think almost, yeah, it would have to be Yu Xiang Chiedza, fish fragrant aubergine. Mm. Mm. which is just the most gorgeous dish and it just takes me back to those early days of eating in these little restaurants around the university and deciding <laughs> I want to learn to cook this. <laughs> so another question Ken from Carlotta, uh, yes. that, what do you think about the whole debate about cultural appropriation? Oh, well you know the thing is we're, we're living in one world and I think it's good that we learn things from each other. There's no such thing as, you know, what is authentic and what uh, we learn things from each other. And I think the whole thing is, does it taste good, right? I mean, um, I bet Fuchsia, even though you wrote a book on Sichuan cooking, I bet sometimes when you cook a dish, you add your own little touches that is a fuchsia touch, right? Which is, you know, maybe not Chinese, but who cares if it tastes good, right? I, I think I, I think we give too much um, a thing about this is Chinese. I mean, we're of one world. I believe in globalization. I think this is how uh, we're, we're gonna survive and how the planet will survive. We need to share with each other. Okay, um, a question from Adrian. This is quite a nice question. So if Ken, if you and I were to meet in real life now, which Chinese dish would we cook for each other? <laughs> I'm going to jump right in and say, well, I'll obviously have to cook you a Sichuanese meal. <laughs> uh, and I, actually, I would make you Peking duck. <laughs> okay. I always okay. think that Peking duck is so, I mean, it's such a wonderful thing. I mean, I cooked God knows how many thousands of Peking ducks uh, over the years <laughs> and I still think it's a, a, a pretty wonderful dish. <laughs> and, and you're, I think a very complicated dish so to cook yes. for me it's going to take you a couple of days of work while I can rustle you up a nice situation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, th this is a question from Mary Gibson so she has a new kitchen and she's put up a personal cooking hall of fame um, with the people who inspired her, and including you, Ken. Oh, and you. <laughs> so um, she, she's asking who 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 ins who are sort of inspired ins figures of inspiration for both of us. Well, for me, you uh, definitely. I I I I remember first reading your Sichuan book. I was bowled over. I said, I I said I have to meet this fuchsia. <laughs> um, I think um, uh, I think. Dia Smith has been really wonderful on, on how she uh, uh, taught cookery at the very beginning. I, I, I remember BBC showed me a tape uh, when they auditioned me. They said, we'd like you to be like, uh, like Delia. I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I think Rick Stein is, is really fabulous but, uh, how he opened up um, a whole world of, of cooking. And there's so many, many, I think, uh, young people like Ching, what she's doing now, um, trying to make also food more modern and accessible. Jamie Oliver, I remember uh, when he called me Mr. Hom. <laughs> I was just a kid. And I, 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 I think there's so many people who are doing food uh, and of course my good friend Mary Berry who uh, I said if I had to come back I probably want to come back as Mary Berry and she says I want to come back as Ken Hom. <laughs> there's so many people I think it's about passion and that's what I loved about your book because you were passionate about something um, even though you didn't grow up in it it doesn't matter you were passionate and you fell in love with it and you told the world about it and that it's about love it's about love right it was passion. yeah some, some of the people in china who who have inspired all my work have been um chefs like yubo who i think you've met yeah, Ken, yubo, you yeah. 
and Lan Gui Jun and, um, and also Dai Jian Jun, who's the owner of a remarkable restaurant, a sort of Chinese ship anise in Hangzhou called mm-hmm. the Dragonwell Manor. And these are people who are passionate about their culinary heritage and who, you know, you were saying earlier that for historical reasons, you know, China had all these very difficult decades and has is sort of recovering, has recovered its food culture. And these people who are so committed to their heritage and mm-hmm. who are absolutely insistent on finding quality ingredients and on, you know, restoring the dignity of this great culinary culture. And also there are sort of historical figures like, I mean, I think Ken, you know, you were talking about quality of ingredients and these these values, which are very, so important in, in for example, modern Californian cuisine. Yes, yes. But which actually, you know, were important in China 2000 years ago and have been so much part of a culture that values food, but then have sort of got lost in the in the 20th century with the revolutions and so yeah, on. And political and, turmoil, I mean. Yeah, and so it's just that I just find it so inspiring that there are people who in, often Often in quite difficult, you know, not not very encouraging circumstances, you know, dealing with pollution and with rapid social change and the development of the countryside, but who are really trying to hold on to this amazing culinary culture. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, Ken, are there any favorite Chinese ingredients that you still can't get outside China? No, I think uh, you can. I think you would agree with me, Fuchsia. You can get anything these days um, because I think the opening of China now, um, in fact, uh, more and more uh, ingredients are widely available. I have a house, uh, I, I go to a country house in this Southwest France. It's in the middle of nowhere. And they open up an Asian market stock full of Chinese things. I couldn't believe it. I said, this is, I mean, remarkable. I'm, uh, before you used to have to go to a big town to get Asian, I mean, especially Chinese ingredients, and they're available everywhere now. And um, uh, well, that's what globalization is about, availability. You agree? I have to say that in some senses, yes. So for example, like in my neighborhood now, within about um, within about 100 paces of my front door, there's a little Chinese shop run by a Fujianese guy, which has all the, all the basic seasonings for Chinese mm-hmm. cooking. And um, so there are Chinese supermarkets, not only in Chinatowns now, yeah. but everywhere. So you can get this huge and uh, more regional ingredients. And in America, you've got the fantastic Mala Market doing online sort of special ingredients like real PCN, Sichuanese chili bean paste and Sichuan pepper. But I have to say, there are the things that I miss are the more the sort of very seasonal local fresh vegetables. Exactly. So things then you like, have to grow it. <laughs> you have to, I know I don't have a garden, but things like okay. in, in Hunan and Sichuan, they yes. have this, this um, kind of variety of brassica called. It's like rape shoots, the rape yes. seed plant, yes. tai tai, hong tai tai, and these little shoots that grow in the winter and they have a little bit of bitterness and they are oh, so gosh. delicious. <laughs> and it's partly I crave them because I can't get them at home. And so oh, you know what you do? You know what you do, Fusha? You bring seeds back and you have a friend or a Somebody grows for you. <laughs> this will be my plan. <laughs> but at the same time, but I, while I, while at the same time, in, as someone who cooks a lot of Chinese food at home, I, of course, I value globalization and the availability. But I think also there is something wonderful about the idea that with some foods, you just have to be there in the right place. I agree with you. I think we need to go back to eating uh, locally and seasonally. And what I mean by that is... Uh, uh, when asparagus comes in season, we need to eat it. And then we should not be eating it in December, for instance. And tomatoes are the same thing. I mean, why are people eating tomatoes in December? <laughs> Especially right when you live in Europe. I mean, that's ridiculous. And, and presumably that's very much part of your life in France, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so, you know, um, this is what I love about actually when you're in rural areas, you eat seasonally. And when it comes, it's very cheap. You just eat like six weeks of asparagus <laughs> and, and then you, you have enough of it for uh, you know, next year. 
There's a, a very nice question here from Jenny Linford. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so, yes, I, I love yeah, it. Yeah, the, the writer, very well-known yes. writer, Jenny Linford, who says, thinking of the Chinese diaspora around the world, which yes. countries do you think offer impressive examples of Chinese cuisine that really do reflect its rich diversity and high standards? That's a very interesting question. I think Canada is very good. Mm, I've never been there. Yeah, I'd love uh, to go. The yeah. Chinese food, I think, in Canada is actually, uh, I think, better than in America, simply because um, they refuse to compromise. Um, and of course, the Chinese food in Asia, what I mean by that is uh, when you have Chinese food in places like Malaysia, uh, it's really uh, uh, very, very good um, in other countries. Uh, even the Chinese food in Bangkok is, is fantastic, surprisingly enough. And um, it's because people want the real thing. They, they don't need to compromise because, because they, people in Thailand already have a great cuisine, lo their local cuisine. So when they eat Chinese, they want the real thing. They don't want it doctored to Thai taste, which is good. Well, I feel like, you know, I think we're heading that way in Britain because yes. a lot of the customers of the new generation of Chinese restaurants are actually Chinese yeah. and they've come over to study or to live in Britain and they don't want to eat adapted Chinese food. They want to eat the food they like at home. And I think that this, you know, Chinese restaurants no longer have to tailor things to please old fashioned British palates, they can just go for it. And I, I agree uh, with you, Fuchsia. I think the, the level of Chinese food in the UK, uh, in Britain has been, uh, I've seen a change over the last uh, almost 40 years. And it's, it's, it's really quite amazing. And not just in London, I mean, just going elsewhere. Um, uh, you can, I mean, just going to uh, places that you wouldn't think have, great Chinese food like Newcastle and and actually you can stumble upon really great Chinese food. Yeah. Mm, um, a question from Polly, who's running the British Library food season with Angela yeah. Cotton, mm -hmm. who um, she's very curious to know which which is each of our favorite regional Chinese food. <laughs> well, Sichuan, uh, I, I mean, like, um, I think you can get really good Cantonese food now in Britain. Um, I don't know about you, Fisher, but I think there's some Hunan is very good. Yeah. In London. Um, I think we're we're living in lucky times for that, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly in the diversity, but but I do find it quite hard to choose because. I, I find, you know, I, I'm trying to go always to new places in China and to go back to places. And I find that literally everywhere I go in China, there's something stunningly interesting and delicious and seductive about the local cuisine. And it's all fascinating. But, you know, Sichuanese cuisine is my first love. And I do have this nostalgic attachment to it. And that's what led me into Chinese cuisine as a young student. And I've also, I don't know about you, but in recent years, I've got really entranced by the, the more delicate cooking of the Jiangnan region. So Hangzhou, mm -hmm. Shanghai, mm -hmm. this area, um, which I did a book about it, Land of Fish and Rice. Yes, and yeah. and that, that's a cuisine that you don't really see much abroad and that is yes. quite hard to replicate because a lot of it's about local fresh oh. ingredients. But um, yeah, there's, there's so much to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's still a big world of food out there <laughs> yeah we're going to have to wind up i'm just going to maybe have one more question this is from jill norman who's a very oh my god yes jill <laughs> and the editor of the book yes. Elizabeth david among many other things so yes. jill says um she's she's interested in cooking in china in the 1980s and um she was there at a, about the same time as you can and had some very poor meals and some very good meals cooked by old chefs who'd been sent to labor in the country side and had recently returned to reopen good quality mm -hmm. restaurants and she just she wonders to what extent did the cultural revolution account for the decline in in good restaurants well i think um the cultural revolution um has its good and bad side. 
the good side was to show that it wasn't working. <laughs> That's the good side. And um, uh, the bad side was that um, it pulled everybody down to a mediocre level. And that unfortunately happened with food. So um, I think you, the China that you see today is a result of the Cultural Revolution. I mean, uh, they tried something, they knew it was a disaster, it didn't work, and they totally reversed uh, the whole thing. And thank God, because now the China that we see today is actually, uh, I've read a lot about, this because my own family suffered a lot during the Cultural Revolution. And so um, uh, the good side of it is that we know uh, that it results in bad food. <laughs> okay, well, at that point we could go on and I'm sorry, I haven't managed to get to everyone's questions, but thank yeah. you for sending them in. And thank, thank you so everybody. much, Ken. And we'll hand back to Angela. Angela, I think you're there. You're going to pop up. I on. am, I am here. Thank you so much. If you shirt Ken, that is just the most joyous, gorgeous, in insightful, clever, everything session. As well as having so many questions coming in, we've also had so much love. Just so many people saying how much they love the work of both of you, but how absolutely fascinating people have found this session. So huge thanks from everybody at the Foodsies and everybody who is watching. Um, and thank you also to KitchenAid, absolutely, for supporting the food season all the way through. Um, plenty more to come uh, at the British Library food season tomorrow night. We have Melissa Thompson, who is leading a terrific session about uh, Black British food stories. On Friday, we are talking to Borough Market and others about how our relationship with uh, food and where we get it and how we get it has changed through the COVID experience. And then next week on the 20th, food season wraps up with Tom Kerridge talking with us from The Hand and Flowers. If you would like to support the work of the British Library, there is a donate button on your screen. But for now, with final massive thanks again to Fuchsia and Ken, um, thank you and good night from the British Library Food Season.